Well, I think we will leave this for the end. Um, we're going to start a new paper this week, but we are not writing the paper this week. So if you have things to do with your Arkansas paper, you just have some maybe brainstorming and, and a little bit of thought. We're going we're gonna to do a, a, another one of our lists of ideas together. And I'm going to send you away with a ton of ideas. And all you kind of have to do is arrange them into an outline, you know, but you're not writing. So if you, if you have no revisions to make on your paper, it's not a very hard week. If you do, you don't have two papers to write in the same week. I, I'm not going to ask you to do that, okay? Um, but let's save that for the end. Let's, and then we can just do it for as long as we have time and generate an, as much as we have time. Let's start off with our history today. First of all, you guys, I, I gave you a little um, prep last week, I think. I told you what you were going to read about was the, the Renaissance in the north, in northern Europe. Once again, I did not bring my map. So, you know, we have the Mediterranean, right? And Italy and Greece and Spain and France. But Northern France, the Netherlands, Germany, England, we kind of talked about last week. It had a weird situation with Henry deciding that they were going to start their own church. We're talking about what's happening in the North and they have a very different climate. It's a very different atmosphere. And do you remember, it's a kind of a different group of people. The people around the Mediterranean, clustered near the Mediterranean, were a lot of them the descendants of the Romans and intermarried with the Lombards and some of these tribes that came in. The people in the North, the Franks and the Saxons and the, uh, uh, the, the people that came in as the Roman Empire fell, they had their own ways about them the Vikings, the Norsemen, they became Christian eventually, but they were always a little different than the people in Italy, you know, and the people in Southern France. <clears throat> so that culture bubbled out. And one of the ways it bubbled out was in their art. We've looked at Italian art. We've seen Raphael and Da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and uh, Giotto and Cimabue. And, but we haven't looked at anybody in the North. Today, I brought in a few pictures from the North. Did I show you guys the praying hands last week? Didn't bring it in again. Okay. Um, Durer. Albrecht Durer was one of the artists that you read about this week. And he was German. He sounds German, doesn't he? Albrecht Durer. And he did all sorts of art. He did watercolors and he did pencil sketches and he did engravings, etchings. So maybe you have done this. My daughter did a beautiful one, but it's too big to bring in. Have you ever done like an art thing where you get this slab of linoleum or something that you can carve and you carve out and you carve a picture into it and everywhere that you carve out will be white on the paper, but everywhere you leave will leave a mark when you ink it. It's sort of like a rubber stamp, picture a rubber stamp. You know how a rubber stamp works. So if you look at the rubber stamp, some of it's sticking out and some of it's grooved in, right? And the part that's sticking out, when you rub it on the ink pad, the ink sticks to it and then it makes a mark. Unbelievable. What time is it, someone? It's 9-11. Wow. I tap on the table and it resets. This thing is crazy. Um, so artists sometimes get what would be like a large rubber stamp, sometimes very a, a, a slab. It's got no, nothing carved into it. And with a tool, you can carve the picture into it. But remember, it's a backwards picture. It's um, the part that you don't carve away gets ink on it and makes a picture, but the part you carve away stays white, which is very complicated. Like I said, my daughter did one of these. It was like this. And... Um, then they inked it. It was for an art class. And she actually, it hung in the Figi for a while. They had an art exhibit and I've got it on my, my living room wall. And I still have the slab that she carved. And then, and then the print. Albert Durer did these. Here's why people love doing these in the late 1500s, 1600s, printing presses. So I write a book. You write a book. Let's have you write the book. You write a book. It's a wonderful book. And you know an artist. And you say, hey, would you like to make some 
woodcut. Sometimes they carved them into wood, blocks of wood, which is just, wow. That's all I have to say. Make a woodcut for me. When we print my book, we'll ink that and include it in the book. And it will be a, a book with illustrations, which is very cool. Albrecht Durer did these. He was a big supporter of the Reformation. So he did lots of woodcuts. He did what we would call political cartoon cartoons. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, they're cartoons, sometimes in newspapers. They're not actually funny. They're more making a comment about the government or politics or something like that. He made comments about the Reformation and the Catholic Church with his, with his woodcuts. But I brought in some Durer pictures. This is a watercolor of an owl. And um, I'm going to, even though the camera's on, bring it out because it's small. It's, it's just gorgeous. It's just, have you guys ever tried to really use watercolors? Not the ones that are in the little box, but really good watercolors that come in tubes, you know? It's hard to get just the right shade. You know, you add too much water, you know, when it runs, and then you don't add enough and it glops. That's this, that's this artistic technical term, it glops. Um, this is his owl, but check, check out these. This is just a gorgeous um, landscape. Detailed. Very detailed, another watercolor. So you can tell he likes nature. He's not only doing sort of religious satire for books, he's doing beautiful um, uh, nature, but this is my favorite. Oh, you can see every hair. You see every hair on this rabbit. So if I think of it, or you could Google Durer praying hands. Um, he has a pencil sketch. I brought it, it was on the back of one of the things I brought last week. And my other kids, I showed the back, but I didn't show you apparently. Um, it's it's very famous. It's just it's just hands like this, um, and it gets you your art. If you ever see this beautiful praying hands, it's probably Durer's praying hands. Um, but if you if you look that up online, just Durer praying hands, you will find this um, beautiful beautiful artwork. Now let me show everybody the his little signature. He has um, and the date fifteen o two. This is um, so. Durer, if you if you like nature, nature art, Durer is your guy. If you like, I don't know, political and religious satire, I suppose Durer is also your guy. Um, he did some portraits as well, but lots of nature studies. Now, the other guy you read about was Hans Holbein. It said Hans Holbein the Younger, because his dad, Hans Holbein Sr., was also an artist. And this is the day I get to bring in the most fun piece of art of the entire year. I look forward to this day all year because this is one of Holbein's most famous pictures. It is called The Ambassadors. I'm going to pass this around, but before I do, I want you to look at something as you pass. Um, you, th these guys are well-dressed. This guy's all duded up. I mean, he's got a nice coat, right? These are upscale noblemen. They are political ambassadors to another country, but they are also well-educated men. The background is littered with all sorts of smart things, like they're musical, and they've got a globe, and they've got scientific instruments and all of this stuff. Now, and then they've got something weird right here. Do you see this? I am not going to tell you what it is, but I want, I'm going to pass it around. I want you to look at it. Now, here, please, 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 please do this for me. If you think you figure it out, don't say it. Don't ruin it for everyone. Keep it in your head if you think you know what's going on there. But just, just take a look at it. I'll give you, give you a moment to pass it around. But if you, if you figure it out, don't, don't out it.
And I will tell you what it is. I will not leave you in suspense. I want to say, great, I hope you had a good look at that. Let's move along. No, I'm not doing that to you. Because, <laughs> oh, I have a, another picture to show from a, yes, that explains a little bit. Okay. What? Oh, yes. They back up. They do that, don't they? Sometimes I'm glad. We are in Moline. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> yes, Emma, Emma was in the junior theater show I went to see, and a lot of my high school students were also. Um, I was very enjoyable. Mm, Davenport Junior Theater. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was. Yes. Well, she was she was a little bit of everything. Yes, it was very very good. Yes. Okay, you think you know what it is? Okay. Amelia has a guess. Okay. So, here here's the deal. I like to play a little game sometimes in the Renaissance that put a picture like this in a frame, but in the frame, there would be a little hole, a little viewing place. So, okay, this is in a frame. It's not, but you know what I mean. Use your imagination. And then in this beautiful frame, there's a little hole down here. And I can go, and if I look... If I look just at the right angle, I can see what it is. I have to play around with it. Of course, I wouldn't if it was in the frame because the hole would be in the exact right place for me to see it. But as I do this, I'm going to let you guys do this again. It's going to take some time, but I think it's worth it. If you look at it from this angle that I'm looking at, the closer I can get to it, the better. This is what you see. It's a skull. It's a skull. You can kind of see it, but if you look straight on, it's hard. But no, I'm gonna pass it around again because this is too fun not to do it. And then look at it. Look at it like this. Look, look, look head on to it from back a little bit, and you will see the skull. Now, while hey guys, guys, while while it goes around, so you can look at it. Let's talk about why in the world would anybody paint a weird skull in their picture? That's, that's, okay, A, because it's cool. B, do you have an idea? It, it was fun. I'm sure Holbein had a, a great time and the people who did this. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. From this side, kind of look head on. It, it's not perfect. You can't see it perfectly, but here. So, yeah. Can, so the more we tip it like that. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's not perfect. If we had the little hole with the frame, it would be better. So, okay, let's talk about this. This skull is what is known, you do not have to write this down, as a memento mori. This is Latin. It means, literally it means remember to die. But they mean remember you're going to die. Remember, you're going to die. And so this goes way back. There were, um, there was a Persian king that supposedly he had someone hired to remind him that he was going to die. There was a Roman emperor they tell this story about that, you know, while he's in the lap of luxury and power, they have somebody that just whispers in his ear, you know, you're going to die someday to keep him humble, to keep him focused. You know, this isn't going to last forever. And so it was very popular in uh, the Middle Ages to have a memento mori. Sometimes if you go to very old cemeteries, 
my family went out east. We went to Boston and we went to Plymouth, you know, and, and everything. And they had cemeteries going back to revolutionary times, right? <clears throat> or even slightly before. And they often have this creepy looking, um, okay, this is going to be really bad. Okay, it's like a face, but it's not, it's not a happy face. And it's got wings. It's it, it's at the top of the tombstone. It's like this. This looks like he's confused or something. Looking that direction. That's not what I want to do. Um, and and it's it just like this creepy. Some, they refer to it as a death's head. Sometimes there's a there's a moth called the death's head moth because it has something like this on its wings that looks like this. And it's it's a memento mori. You're supposed to visit the cemetery and think about the person buried there, but you're also supposed to look at that and say, "That's going to be me someday. I better." keep focused about, you know, how great life is and all the money I have and all the power I have and talents. No, you're, it's not going to last always. You're not always going to be here. So this is a memento mori, but it's also a bit of a fun game. And this is the most famous picture that does it, but there were other pictures that hid some, not always a skull, hid some little object that you could only really see if you knew that in the frame there was going to be a little peephole somewhere, and then if you looked through it at an angle, you would see it. Holbein. Um, Holbein and Durer, two of the most famous northern artists. Okay, let's talk about the reading questions I gave you this past week. These are on page 51 of your reading guide. And the first question I asked you, we talked about this guy a couple of times. What did Johann Gutenberg do, and how do you think this changed the world? Emma, what did Gutenberg do? He invented the printing press. He invented the printing press. Now, maybe not invented, because apparently in China there was printing. There might have been people before Gutenberg that were experimenting with printing. But what he did do was he made the first machine to make it really easy and useful. So let's talk about how printing works. You know, nowadays, I'm assuming that when you have books printed, it's all digital. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the words are typed in. It's sort of like printing your papers out from your computer, right? But, but when it started, there were little blocks of wood or metal, and each one had a letter, like a stamp. It's like, uh, my, my kids had this. They had alphabet rubber stamps. Maybe you guys had something like that. And each stamp was a letter. Of course, now I need a set of small letters and a set of capital letters, right? Because sometimes I need a capital one. And then I need a set of uh, end marks and punctuation marks. I need a set of numbers. So it gets fairly complicated. And they put all of these um, blocks called type. This was the type. They put it into a box. Here's a little fun fact. So you have a case with all of your type in it. And, and, um, and I've got something I want to print. And I pick out all the letters I need to make those words. And probably I'm going to need several of a lot of letters. Because if I want to print a whole page, I'm going to need a lot of E's and A's and probably T's. All the Wheel of Fortune letters that everybody picks, you know, R's and S's. I'm going to need a lot of those. Um, so I have to go to the case and I have to pick them all out. Um, the case has two, you know, I open it up and there's part of them here, part of them down here. In the upper case were the capital letters. In the lower case were the small letters. This is why we call them uppercase and lowercase. Sometimes we call them that. Sometimes we call it capital, you know, this is a capital A and this is a small a, but often they call them uppercase and lowercase. It, <laughs> printers kept them in the upper part of the case or the lower part of the case. And we still say it, even though nobody keeps type in cases anymore. And so I, you know, I have a whole page that I want to print. So I have to spell out every word. I have to put every letter. Of course, the letters are backwards, right? Because just like rubber stamps, if you stamp it on something, it's going to be the reverse. Uh, go home and get a rubber stamp and look at it and then stamp it, and look how everything's backwards on the stamp. Yeah, Amelia. Oh, yes, go right ahead. Um, so I've got to pick them out and put them into the little machine, and then ink it. And then um, the machine is set up so that it will run 
pages through and it will hit each page with the set of type. I don't know how often you have to ink it. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know the details of the workings of the printing press. Um, I do know, um, when I was a little girl, my mom worked at a, at a bookstore that sold Bibles. And people would sometimes have their name impressed on the Bible, like a leather Bible. You could have your name in gold. And so um, sometimes it would go, just stay there after school, you know, while my mom was working. And she would put the type. I just was fascinated by this. They had a little machine. And it was just like that. She put the metal type in and then put this gold leaf across it and then put the Bible in and pull the lever and press it down. And it pressed it into the leather. It pressed the gold leaf with the type. So cool. So it's the only time I've ever actually witnessed type, you know, being picked out of a case and put into a machine and printed. I assume they still, you know, if you go to a bookstore, do bookstores even do that for you anymore? I don't know. Um, you know, it was, she manually did it with the type. Uh, that, that's what Gutenberg did for us. He invented a machine that does it easily and rapidly. Not as rapidly as we can do it today when you can just type that page into a computer. But still, after you set the page, remember what we were coming from. If I wanted 100 copies of this page, I had to get somebody to sit down and write it out 100 times. Or I had to get 100 of you to all sit down and write it out for me. And now Gutenberg can print 1,000 of them, right? With, with the work of one time setting the type instead of writing it all. It was revolutionary. And this is the, the second part of the question I asked you. How do you think this changed the world? We talked about this a little bit already. What, what changes when it's so very easy to print out books? Liam. People can be smarter. People can learn more. I don't know if they're smarter, but they certainly have more access to information. Not always the same thing, unfortunately, but I understand where you're going with that. Books had been exceedingly expensive. I might have had to, to save several months pay to buy a book. It's like us saving for a car. Maybe not as expensive as a car. Cars are really expensive now. Um, I'm trying to think of some very large, uh, a, new, a new living room furniture. You know what I mean? Maybe your parents want new living room furniture. And so they're like, for the next six months, we're going to put back money so that we can buy a new couch. Great. These people are like, we're going to put back money for the next six months so we can buy a book. Wow. It's expensive, right? Because it takes a lot of labor to hand copy a book. Now, they're cheap. Now, if I have a greater likelihood of getting a book, is there a greater likelihood I will bother to learn to read? I will have something to read, right? You know, farmers now maybe want to make sure their children learn to read because they're going to have access to a book. They're going to have access to a Bible. For the first time in the history of the church, somebody might actually have their own copy of a book of the Bible or of much of the Bible or eventually of a whole Bible. People couldn't do that before. That was a very expensive book. So now we want to make sure everybody can read because everybody has something to read. Here's another thing that we mentioned, I think, a few weeks ago. Say I have some great ideas. Say I have some not so great ideas. And I want the world to know. In the past, I had to hire a team of people to copy out, you know, my ideas in a little pamphlet or flyer or whatever. Even, you know how you go in stores and there's bulletin boards with a bunch of advertisement flyers tacked to it, you know? Even if I just want one of those, I have to write out, you know, 50 copies of those and distribute them. Now I can print out thousands of them. I can put them all over the place. Everybody's going to know my ideas really quick. It might have taken years for my ideas to get out. Now it might take weeks. This is... This is what happened to Martin Luther. We're going to be talking about the Reformation shortly. If Martin Luther had lived before Gutenberg, there may not have been a Reformation. Because there would have just been this guy in Germany saying stuff and nobody would have known. It really makes a difference that this happened 
after Gutenberg because he had some ideas we'll talk about in a few weeks and some problems with what the church was doing. And he printed them and sent them to people, distributed them. Within a month, within two months, everybody was buzzing about him. That never would have happened before. So it honestly changed the world. It changed the world of thinking anyway. And, and we sort of take it for granted. I don't know about you. I have a lot of books. I like books. I have a lot of books in my house. And uh, be, because in most of my books aren't very expensive. I have a few fairly expensive books, but most of them are not. And to, to imagine a world where nobody had that, or very, very few people, unless you were really, really rich, had a library like I have, like you guys probably have, all of you, in your homes. You have a rich person's library, once upon a time. Um, okay, Gutenberg. Let's move on to the next question. Um, Oh, can I mention something else before we go on? I noticed something I highlighted here. You know how, let's just use it in America. Not everybody speaks exactly the same. So if you're in the South, they have a certain pronunciation and they'll be more likely to say y'all, which I love because English does not have a plural U. I think we need, we should have a, we did once upon a time and we don't anymore. So if I say you, you don't know if I mean one of you or all of you, but in the South you do. Y'all, y'all do such and such. And then, you know, I'm talking to all of you. If you live in um, Minnesota, I have a certain way of talking, certain areas, you live in Boston. Not only do you have a different accent, but you actually use different words. Um, so when I was a little, I may have told you this story already. If I've already told, told you about the German teacher when I was in seventh grade. No. Okay, good. It's new for you. <clears throat> so I, I was in a German class when I was in seventh grade and the teacher amazed and astounded me. Um, this was in Alaska and a lot of people who live in Alaska come from somewhere else. You know, so a lot of my classmates were like me. They grew, they had grown up part of their lives somewhere else. And so he said, I'm going to go around the room and ask you to give me, fill in the blank. I'm going to give you a little saying and you tell me what goes there. Red as a, you're as red as a, and he goes around. And of course I, and this might not be as easy for you guys, but I happen to have a grandma that used this phrase. Um, my instant thought you're red as a beet. You're red as a beet. That's what grandma would say. Come on in, get a dress of lemonade. You're red as a beet. And imagine my surprise when other kids in the class said, you know, like red, oh, I can't remember what they said. Like red is, red is a fire engine, red is a, you know, there was other things. And I was thinking, you're so wrong. You're, it's red as a beet. What is wrong with you? So but three or four of us gave answers, right? And I gave my answer. And he went around and he told everybody where they were from in the country. He knew. He looked at me and he said, you're from the Midwest, aren't you? Yes, I am. Red's beat. It's a Midwestern thing, right? So, so even today, we have colloquialisms like this that we use. Uh, colloquial means something special to a, a particular place, particular area. But... Once upon a time, not only did everybody have different words they might use in phrases or different accents, but they actually had different spellings and different ways of actually phrasing things. It actually wasn't until, I don't know, less than 200 years ago that we have American English spelling. This is the way you spell this word. This is why I tell those of you who might struggle with spelling, just keep working on it, but don't beat yourself up. Because there was a time when everybody spelled it the way they wanted. And it wasn't that long ago. I know some, some of us really like the sound of that, Emily. Um, I, I've given you my Andrew Jackson quote. It's a poor mind that can think of only one way to spell a word. Lewis and Clark spelled the same word different ways in their journals. They couldn't make up their minds. So, so, so when you have people copying out books, 
they just phrase things. Well, if you're copying a book, you phrase it the way the author did. If you're writing a new book, you just phrase it your own way. And nobody except the people who live near you is going to see it because there aren't very many copies. We're going to assume it's not the work of a great genius. You know, it's just a book. But after books are printed and they're sent all over a country, people will read this book and they say, oh, this, this is good English or French or German, whatever it is. Th this is really good. I, I think we should write like this. I think this is a good way. We, we should use this phrase. We should use this word order. I like this. And it standardizes the language. Everybody starts reading the same phrases. Do you see what I mean? Because they have a book, all, they all have the same book printed in the same place. And in England, that was sort of like King James English. So if you've read the King James Bible or read any Shakespeare, the a great similarity between a Shakespeare play and the King James Bible, it's the same language because they started printing these and everybody read it. And so if you memorized Psalm 23 out of the King James Bible, I mean, if you memorize Psalm 23, everybody memorized the King James Version. It became part of the way you speak English and it standardized it. So most people in America, despite the accents, you know, and the red is a beat thing, we can completely understand each other. Sometimes in the deep South, it can be hard. But most of the time we, we understand each other and we use the same phrases. In England, even though it's standardized, there's still people that sort of don't speak a standardized English. So if you've ever watched All Creatures Great and Small, there's a PBS show, they, they did it back 40 years ago when I was in college and now they're remaking it. Um, I think BritBox. Uh, it's on some other streaming service, I know, because my son was watching it. Um, the Yorkshire. They're in Yorkshire. It's the north of England and they have a very thick, not only a thick accent, but they have weird ways of saying things. And in the show, people will visit the Yorkshire, northern England area and they can't, like, I don't know what you're saying. But, I mean, Englishmen will visit and say, I, I, I don't understand you. Because their English is not standard English. They, they would call it in England, the King's English. Um, okay. Does that make sense to you guys? That if we have books being printed somewhere, we're all going to start speaking the same. Okay. Let's move on now to what is humanism and how does it differ from the focus of study in the Middle Ages? What do we mean by humanism? Go for it, Noah. A, the schoolmen, scholars, what, I, if I'm a humanist, I am scholarly. What am I scholarly about? What, am I scholarly about math? Am I scholarly about science? Human ideas. Human ideas. Here's, here's what Dorothy Mills says. Humanist literature put man and his life in this world in the foreground. Humanist, right? Things that pertain to human beings. Everything that touched man was of importance. His thoughts and his philosophy of life, his standards of conduct, his deeds, his difficulties, his triumphs, his love of beauty, and the expression he gave it. The study of these things was called humanism. They were the humane studies, the humanities. Sometimes colleges still use that term, the humanities. So history and literature and art, and music, and all of those things that touch us as human beings, drama, that, that's humanist study. Now, what, so Noah mentioned the schoolmen. They're kind of before the humanists. They're the scholastics. They're like Thomas Aquinas. What, do you remember at all, what, what were these people writing and about and studying and talking about a lot? What did St. Thomas Aquinas talk about Theology a lot? And philosophy. Theology and philosophy. God. They were very concerned about studying God. And suddenly we have people say, you know what? We want to study man. Man. Now, here's a hard question. I don't know if it's hard. It doesn't have an obvious answer. Is that necessarily anti-Christian? Is literature necessarily anti-Christian? Or, or art, or music, or history. Because on the one hand, I said, these people only care about, I don't, they don't only care about, they're primarily interested in what 
has to do with human beings. C could you do that in a way that recognizes that human beings are made in the image of God? Sure, sure. As a matter of fact, I'm going to throw out there that if you don't, then you, you've made a mistake because that's what we are, you know? It's like if you set out to study a creature, but you didn't realize what that creature really was. Um, you set out to study, I don't know, an amoeba, but you thought it was like a, a dog and you could train it to do things. You mistook its nature. That's kind of a silly example. Although now I have a picture of a scientist in a lab trying to train the amoeba to, I don't know, what does an amoeba, roll over, turn? I don't know what you train an amoeba to do. Yes. Uh, like a single-celled organism that you could just see under a microscope. Like just a, maybe not single-celled, but you know, just a, just a little tiny microscopic creature. If I thought that that was a trainable creature, I would be making a mistake. If I think that human beings aren't created in the image of God, once upon a time, and then sinned and messed that up, then I've got a mistaken idea. So these humanists that we're going to talk about, many of them were Christians. Today, if you hear the word humanist, it usually doesn't mean Christian. When I was a little girl, they, they, they referred to them as secular. Oh, this is Latin day. Secular humanists. Does anybody know what secular means? Have you ever heard this word before, first of all? Has something been referred to as secular? I feel like I should, but I can't remember. That's okay. What do you, what do you think, Noah? Sort of modern. Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. Um, secular means worldly. Um, or um, a, 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 apart from the supernatural. Right? So if I say something is secular, it belongs to this world, the natural world. It's not God. It's not um, spirits and angels. Those things wouldn't be secular. It actually comes from a Latin word, secula. In secula, seculorum, into a and unto ages of ages. Um, it means an age, secula. So it means this age, this time period. You don't have to remember. If, that, if you like where words come from, like I do. That's thrown in there for you. If you don't, just forget it. Um, but but these guys we're going to talk about were Christian humanists. They said, you know what? We recognize that God God made human beings. God made them in His image, and we have botched that image. But He still gives us His grace, you know. And we make beautiful things. We write beautiful music. And we write great books and we think lofty thoughts. And, and here's the other thing. Do you know what it's like to be a dog? From No, you don't. Do you, do you know what it's like to be in a... I, that's, oh, man, that would just be so boring. You know what? Who am I to judge that an amoeba has a boring life? I don't know. What do I know what it's like to be? I know what it's like to be a human being. This is the thing we all share with each other, right? And with everybody who's ever lived in any time. So when Mr. Holbein painting his memento mori in his artwork, I don't really know much about Mr. Holbein except, honestly, a few pictures that he did. But I, I can tell you a few things about him. He probably got angry sometimes. He probably had things he loved. He probably had things he detested. He probably had hopes were unfulfilled. He probably got frustrated. Why do I know this about him? Because he's a human being, right? So one famous humanist in England said, the proper study of mankind is man. The proper study for mankind is man. And people have said, no, proper study for mankind is everything. <laughs> we have minds that want to learn about everything, including God. But man is really easy for us to study because we are one. I know it from the inside. I've got inside information on what it means to be a human being that I don't have about any, anything else. I don't have it about God. I don't have it about nature. So that's what these guys were about. They were about, let's, let's examine the thing that we really know we have a front row seat for. But these guys weren't saying we're limiting all knowledge and inquiry to only this world and material things. 
They believed in God. Modern day humanists often imply there is nothing else to study beyond what we can touch and feel and see and, and, and test in a lab. But I, so I want, I want you to have the difference because the main guy that you read a lot about, and he was our lovely originator of the copia exercise that you wrote, was Erasmus. Erasmus, sort of, if you talk about Renaissance Christian humanism, we're talking about Erasmus. There were others. They mentioned Thomas More in England and some of the great thinkers in England. What book published by Erasmus greatly furthered the study of the Bible? Elliot, what did he do? What? The praise of God. Oh, you know what? That That is true. That wasn't what I was fishing for, but let's talk about that one. What, do you remember what it said that was about? Or what did he do in that book? So why did, why did you guess that, Elliot? That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, will, I will tell you because uh, that wasn't what I was thinking. But Elliot was is is more on the track of what what book furthered reform, church reform. Did you think of something, Liam? Do you have something? Oh, well, I was just going to say. I was just going to say. Oh, the other one. No, no, no I was just going to. Oh, please do. You want me to go ahead? Is that what you're saying? Okay, so so. The Praise of Folly is, is a satire. It's like a joke. And he wrote it to Thomas More. It's very funny. I have a copy at home. It's not very long. It's really easy to read. It's probably free on the internet if you ever want to look at it. So in, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, kids, like students in, in schools, had to do writing exercises, just like you. And sometimes they'd set exercises. You guys, your exercise is the persuasive essay right now, right? Well, one exercise they did was to praise. It's called an encomium. Praise something highly. Praise a person. And there was like, praise his family, praise his deeds, praise his character, praise his, his country that he's from. And they had set things they had to put in it, just like you have set things, like put this in your introduction, put this. So they would praise somebody. So in Praise of Folly, he, just as a joke, he decided to praise something that wasn't a good thing. He praised foolishness. How great foolishness is for the world. And he, and he goes up, he says, you know what? You know, without foolishness, no one would ever get married. Because it's just a stupid thing to do, you know? Because marriage is full of heartaches and, and, and irritations and only fools, you know, fall in love as a, you know, song from the 50s and 60s said. Um, and so, but then the human race would die out because no one would have kids. Right, so yay for foolishness because it makes people get married. Okay, so it was kind of a joke like that. But he said, yay for foolishness because it makes people trust the priests and the monks, even though they see that they don't live what they preach and that they're gluttons and greedy. And so he's slipping all this stuff into this book, right? Sounding like he's praising folly. Yay, because the church would fall apart if we didn't, you know, weren't stupid and foolish enough to follow these people who are obviously not good shepherds. All right. It got him in a little hot water, as you can imagine. He was not, he got a little bit in trouble with that. So that definitely was a move towards criticizing the church, right? Towards saying something's got to change. I was thinking of something else. And this was particularly not just the church in general, but studying scripture. He did something that helped people study scripture. Did anybody write something else down besides the praise of folly? Do it album. The Greek New Testament. He learned Greek at a time when a, the study of Greek was just sort of reblossoming in Europe. You know, for a thousand years, nobody really learned Greek in Europe. They didn't have access to, to most of Plato, to Greek drama, to the Iliad and the Odyssey. They couldn't read it. They didn't have Latin translations of a lot of it. So it was just closed to them. And then Constantinople falls in 1453, and everybody comes, comes west, and they're bringing these Greek books, and they're bringing knowledge of Greek. Like, I'll set up as a Greek teacher. Erasmus learned Greek, and then he started collecting all the editions of Greek, the Greek New Testament he could find. And you might say, what, what does that mean? You probably know, 
probably in your Bible, there sometimes there are little footnotes that say, according to this manuscript, it says this. According to this manuscript, it says that. Sometimes, because when we copy things out, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes uh, it's it's slightly different phrasing. Sometimes there's a different different wording. Sometimes there's just a plain different word. So he collected and he compared them and went with what was the most likely or the oldest version, right? And he compiled it all into one book and he said, here is the New Testament in Greek, which doesn't, doesn't really exist anywhere. Do you know what I mean? We don't have, do you know what I mean by that? We don't have a copy of the entire New Testament in Greek go going back really much before Erasmus. You know, you might have a copy of the letter to the Philippians, right? Loose, loose copies. But in the, in the West, they were using a Latin Bible, right? So they didn't really have this all collected in one place. And so he collected it and he said, okay, now, if you want to know what the Bible really says in the original language, there you go. Have at it. Learn Greek. And you too can read the Bible the way it was actually written and what it really meant. And so, of course, Erasmus is living at the same time as Martin Luther and the, um, the reformers. And one of the reformers' uh, mottos is another Latin phrase, ad fontes, to, to the fountains, to the sources. They wanted to go back to the original sources, right? What what was the church really like at the very beginning? What did the Bible actually say? Not in a Latin translation, but in the Greek. They wanted to go back to that, and Erasmus made that possible for them. Does that does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I'm just looking at the time. We need to, for some reason. How does my how does my hour and a half always disappear? I don't know. What was Erasmus's opinion of Luther and the Reformation? Is he on board? Do you want to join him? What do you think, Emma? wanted a calmer reformation. Yeah. Luther said, look, look, Erasmus, you're brilliant. You wrote the praise of Bali. We know you think the church has problems. You're a Greek scholar. If you would just put your stamp of approval on my movement, on what I'm doing, be awesome. And Erasmus says, yeah, I don't think you're doing a good thing. Uh, it, it says, uh, in the first place, Erasmus was a scholar. And as such, he believed it was not his part to take uh, sides in controversies. Um, he believed change should come without violence. He had a sane, balanced attitude. Um, and he, it says he admonished Luther to be moderate. He just didn't think... We'll revisit this in the next few weeks when we talk about the Reformation. We have two camps of people during the Reformation. Really, really only these two camps. Here's where the camps agree. Something's wrong with the church. The church has abuses. The church is doing things that are wrong. Yes, the priests are ignorant. And the bishops just do it for money. And popes are selling out. And we, we all agree, right? But these people said, you know what? We need to change the church from within. We need to talk about this. We need to get back to God and serving him. But there's only one church. We can't break it apart. And these people said, no, that that those people are wrong. <laughs> the church is irredeemable. We are going to start over again. Does that make sense? And Erasmus was one of these, right? There's problems. I'm totally happy to poke fun at the problems. But we can't break it. There's one Jesus started one church. We can't just break it and start a new one because we don't like it. But Luther said, it's already broken. It's already off the rails. We have to start again. So Luther and Erasmus didn't look good along. Luther had a bit of a temper. And um, he, uh, Erasmus wrote a book called On the Freedom of the Will. And it was just what it sounds like. It was saying that people have the ability to choose right from wrong. And Luther wrote back a book called The Bondage of the Will. <laughs> he's talking. And he, in the book, he talks to Erasmus. You, Erasmus. And he's really, he's really insulting. Luther's very insulting. He just was a really hot-tempered guy. 
and he just rips Erasmus up one side and down the other. I have a copy of Bondage of the Will, so I've read, it's been years ago that I read this. Wow, wow, that's really mean. Um, so they actually wrote things and published them against each other, you know. But Erasmus didn't want anything to do with it. Um, okay, who was Thomas More and what happened to him? Luke. And he was martyred. He was martyred. Why? Why did he die, and why would we call it being martyred? Do you know? Uh, Do you remember what the oath said? Would say? It did have something to do with the Church of England. Liam, you had, or Liam or Elliot, would was one of you? Did you want to say? Would you want to add? Well, no, it, we we were past that. That was that was Wolsey. That we were past that. At this point, Henry has said, "You know what? I am now the head of the Church of England, and I give myself a divorce." Boom, you're divorced. Um, he was he was trying to make everybody every government official had to sign an oath that Luke was talking about that swears allegiance to the king as the head of the church. The king is the official head of the church. And Thomas More is like, no, you, you're you not. You can't be because there's only one head of the church. I mean, Jesus is the head of the church, but you know, in the church, at least for the West, the Pope is the head of the church. You don't get to just become your own Pope. You can't do that. You can't elect yourself Pope. And he wouldn't sign it. And Henry cajoled and threatened and finally locked him up. And Thomas More, Thomas, brilliant man, friend of Erasmus, author of that Utopia book that we talked about, where he complained about the enclosures and wrote about this this mythical perfect island that some traveler visited. It's very entertaining. Um, he he said, "I won't do it." And and his family came to him in prison and said, "Look, you, he's going to kill you." I'm like, well, I guess then I'm going to die because I'm not going to do it. It's wrong. So um, he is purported to have said, and many sources say he said, tell Henry that I die the king's good servant, but God's first. I've never been wrong to the king. I have served him well, but I'm God's servant first. Ergo, as Luke said, he, he would be considered a martyr. Because why did he die? He died upholding the church. He died upholding the truth. That you, you, that Henry can't just decide to start his own church. That's weird. Can't do that. So that's Thomas More. Um, all right. I'm sorry. It's ten o'clock already, and I want to take at least this whole half hour to work on our, you know, paper ideas. But does anybody have a comment or a question? Anything that you read this week that we didn't talk about, didn't have a chance to touch on? Um, we're skipping chapter eight. I don't remember why. <laughs> so I'm looking at chapter eight. Oh, um, it's all about education. And so, you know what? If you would like, it, it's famous educators, English education, education of women. <clears throat> you ladies might be interested. What, what was Renaissance education like for women? If you want to read that, it is optional, but we're reading chapter nine. And it will remind you, because you're reading questions, say chapter nine, and if you start reading chapter eight and you look for the answers to these questions, you will not find them. And you will say, I must be reading the wrong chapter. I don't know where these questions are. So we're reading chapter nine, eight is optional, okay? And um, we are also, I'll just throw this out there, we're starting the two towers. No, we did we start the two? No, we're starting the two towers. Okay. Sorry. Wow. So I want you to read the two towers, TT, as it, we'll call it, chapters one through four. Okay? Um, and for the rest of our time, I want to talk about this next paper that we're going to do. It's very similar to what you just did, two of. You did the Middle Ages one and the should, should the Arkenstone have been given to Bard. This is going to be, you can put a little bit more of your personality into this one, though. Okay, because I feel like, you know, we need to let you guys cut loose a little bit. You know, it's, it's like, 
got to do something fun every once in a while. Can, can I take this away? Does everybody see chapter one through four? OK. So here's what I want you to imagine for your paper. You are at the Council of Elrond in Rivendell. You. You may be a main character that's in the book. Totally fine with that. You may be an imaginary character who happens to be there. You may be like an elf that happens to be serving food. Do you know what I mean? And walks through the council. I don't know. It sounds like a top secret council. So maybe they weren't just letting random elves come in. Don't know. But since this is sort of a fictional thing anyway, you just go with it. Whatever. You could be, now let's let's make you, you, you no, I was just going to go there. And I thought you can't be an animal because you got to be given a speech. And it will freak everybody out if a rat gives a speech. Oh, black rider. I think it's a black rat. Uh, no, because it needs to be somebody who could feasibly be at the council. And at this point, black riders are not penetrating into Rivendell. Do you know what I mean? Their defenses are such that I don't think that a black rider could cross the borders of, of Elrond's realm if it wanted to. Um, yes. No, because you need to give a speech. So you may you may say, I am Boromir. You may say, I am Gloin or Gimli. You may say, I am Legolas. You may say, I am like an attendant on one of those. Like I am a servant that came along with Boromir, even though Boromir came along. You can make stuff up. It's fine. Or I am, I am Merry or Pippin or, you know, except they're not really very good at speech making. But, <clears throat> okay, does everybody get that part? You are someone at the Council of Elrond. Don't care who. Don't care who. Yes. No. You can make someone up. That's what I'm saying. But but Henley, Henley, it needs to be somebody who could feasibly be there. So you're going to need to be, you know, a man or an elf or a dwarf or a hobbit. Do you know what I mean? You're going to need to be a, a race that could be there. And you've got to be somebody who can actually get up and speak. Those are the parameters. If you want it to be one of the people that is mentioned in the book, fine. If you want it to be like, and I am, um, I don't know, I am I'm trying to think of a dwarf name. I am Dwibbly. I am Dwibbly the dwarf who traveled with Gloin and Gimli to the council as their, you know, assistant. Great. Okay, whatever. Just make it up. That's fine. But it can't, it needs to be somebody who could feasibly be there. Yes. Yes. So this is going to be from your point of view. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to get up in the council. Not yet. Not yet. And you're going to try to persuade them either that the ring should be kept and used or the ring should be destroyed. All right. Now, now, so here's what we need a blank, get a blank piece of paper somewhere. Yes, Emma, do you have a question or a comment? Sorry, okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. It might, it might be. So I, we need, we need two columns, keep or destroy. Keep or destroy. You know, there's a lot of arguments given us in the council chapter. And sprinkled throughout the book. Um, and so I, I feel like it's going to be harder to do this one because, but, you know, Boromir makes some pretty good cases too. So we're probably going to steal a lot from Boromir here. It's okay. It's okay. So tell me anything. Let's, let's start throwing it up there. A reason to keep it or a reason to destroy it? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's, we, we can even number these. Um, it, uh, gives us power. The ring gives us power. I'm going to say us because, you know, I'm talking like one of the people there. Um, what, what, why does this ring give us power? What, what's the ring again? Okay. So we're going to put underneath this. It's, it's the most powerful magical object ever. Yes. <laughs> in, in Middle Earth. In Middle Earth. Ooh, okay. Uh, and 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 what can I what can I do with it? Okay. I can. I, okay. I can destroy. I can destroy others with it. Okay. 
Um, uh, and, and what else can I do for myself? Can you can save yourself? I, oh, yeah. Um, okay. Can we, can we, let's put that another one. Um, the ring will save us. Let's put that as a, as a, I, do you, I'm just going to show you guys what I'm doing. I'm going to let you in behind the scenes. When you say things that seem bigger to me, I'm going to put them as a category. And when you say things that are smaller, that support it, I'm actually sort of organizing my thoughts as I go. Do you see? You don't have to do that when you do, you know, a brainstorming. But I see the ring will save us is kind of bigger because um, uh, what, what does the ring, what does the ring rule do you, specifically? It rules the other rings. Who has the other rings? The, okay, the Black Riders have some. Does it? Okay, so so um, we we could command the Black Riders. If we had the ring, we could command the Black Riders, which is really good because they are the they're a super big threat. We know what I mean by that. They're they're nasty. They can stab you with their magic swords, and it, it about kills you. It turns you into a wraith. This is bad news, right? If I had the power to to make them do what I wanted them to do, this this would be awesome. Um, who who else has rings? The elves, the elves have rings, so I could uh, strengthen. Well, I could, but you know, if I'm if yeah that. I don't know that I want to say it like that in my speech. I can control the elves. I want to say that in the place where the elves live. Maybe I should strengthen the elves. I'm going to strengthen the elves who have the other rings, the other three rings that were given to elves. The other other things I put. The other rings. Okay. Can we think of another thing that we could do because it gives us power? These these. These have power too. It's very powerful. We can destroy others with it. And um, basically, if I have the most powerful object, who am I? I, I can, uh, we can become the rulers or kings or whatever. What, what else? Well, keeping the ring, make sure, if we keep the ring, what won't happen to it? It won't be sold. By whom? By the Sauron. Yes, yeah, Sauron. Well, so, okay, Saruman wants it too. Okay, so we've got, we've got tons of stuff. Okay, this is, this is, I'm running out of room, so this is not going under destroy it. All right, we might just have to put a destroy up here. Um, um, uh, we will save the ring. Let's just put them both. From Sauron... And Saruman. Yes, from the two S guys who sound very, very much, unfortunately, like the same name. Um, so, what is what is Sauron's deal? Who is Sauron? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? What? Noah. He's the he's the Dark Lord. So, so um, and what will he do? What will he do to all of us if he gets it? He will crush us. Like a bug, as they say. Um, you ever do that? You know, you can put people's heads between and crush you like a bug. Okay, that's what he will do. Only he will not do it. You know, he will do it for real. So Sauron will destroy us if he gets it. If he gets ring, we know this. He's got a long history in Middle Earth of dirty deeds. All right. Saruman wants to do what? Uh, control everyone else. Yeah, Saruman, what, he was once Saruman the White. What is he now? Saruman. He's Saruman of many colors. So he's become Saruman of many colors. In other words, I will do whatever it takes. Will, um, will, um, be completely corrupted by the ring. I mean, he's already pretty corrupted, but, you know, he'll go all the way by the ring. 
And if he is, uh, he, Saruman, will then destroy us. You know, it's like Galadriel said, right? We can put this on our destroy side. Anybody who takes this ring is, is going down. You can't, you can't withstand its power forever. And the more power you have, you ever thought about this? Like the more, the more intelligent a person is, the more ability they have to do evil things. Like evil, that's what we call evil geniuses, right? Like evil, just average people do average bad things. Evil geniuses do horrible bad things. Saruman would is is a genius. Saruman is is powerful. So he has a lot of potential to go bad. Okay, so the ring gives us power. The ring will save us. It will save the ring from Saruman. And if Saruman gets the ring, it will just he will destroy us. And I'm gonna add um as a corollary to this, Middle Earth will uh, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll cease to exist. I mean, not technically cease to exist, but it will be completely changed. It will be utterly Middle Earth as we know it. Now, I like this, and here's why. We have one, two, three. Well, isn't that convenient? Because our papers have one, two, three paragraphs giving us reasons. And each reason is supposed to have supports. Don't say I never did anything for you. There it is. If you if you want to argue this way. Now, I'm going to wait and make sure everybody's got this written down because I'm just going to erase it and put the destroy on because we're running out of room. And Emma, you might even think of things that we didn't add to the list. This is not, this is not necessarily everything we could have thought of. This is what we've got 15 minutes left and you know, we're going to move on this, but so go, go for it. But this gives everybody the ability to write a speech from this perspective, if you want to, but so let's wait until everybody's got it copied down. I know I was writing really fast. No, let's not. No, no, we're not taking things off the shelf and passing it around. Oh, oh, it's a pencil sharpener. I'm sorry. I thought it was something to play with. I'm sorry. Totally can sharpen your pencils. All right, are you done, Luke? Does everybody have this? It's going away. All right. All right. Now, let's see if we can think of reasons to destroy it. Destroy. Tell me a reason to destroy the ring. Noah. It's, it's bad. I like it. It's bad. The ring is bad. Yes, Emma said it corrupts all who um, uh, possess it. Uh, can you think of an example of someone being corrupted by its possession? Gollum. Example. Gollum. Enough said right there. A creature who apparently wanted it so bad just by seeing it that he murdered his companion and took it and then became just like his self, his, his, his former self just disappeared. Do you know what I mean? He just... He just withered away and collapsed into himself. It's, it is, you know, it is the pity of Bilbo rules the fate of many. Um, and uh, who, do we have any testimony that it's bad? Oh, actually, I like, I like, we're just going to, um, wise, let's make it that its own. Wise people say it's bad. We're, we're just going on the, Hitting the bad part very hard here. Uh, can we think of another just in general? It's bad. It corrupts everyone. For example, Gollum. Um, and um, uh, who who else has been corrupted by desire for the ring? Saruman. 
Bill, you know, Bilbo a little bit. Um, oh, let's just put we we can we can have four. Okay, so another example. Example two, Saruman um, uh, has all already been changed by desire for the ring. And then we also have poor Bilbo. Bilbo, even a good hobbit, the best of hobbits, maybe, um, uh, what was beginning to change. And remember, this is a creature who, as far as we know, alone in the history of Middle Earth, voluntarily gave up the ring, just handed it over to someone else. Frodo handed it to Tom Bombadil, but I think he was under some sort of Tom Bombadil enchantment. You know what I mean? Like, he was just kind of, what? What? Okay, here you go. Um, but, but no one, no one in the history of the ring had parted with the ring voluntarily. Yes. Oh, Boromir also. So we've got lots of, you know, we could just do a whole huge paragraph on the ring's effects of corruption. Now, are there wise people who have said, it's bad, you can't use it? Gandalf. Gandalf says, no. Who else? Elrond? Elrond says, no. Uh, the no means you, you can't. Okay, I shouldn't say no, because it says like, no, don't destroy it. Says Gandalf says it's bad. Elrond says it's bad. Anybody else? I can think of one other very great lady. What? what? Galadriel? That's who I was thinking of. Did anybody say something else? Bilbo said it was bad. Did Bilbo say it was bad? Did he? Yeah, he, he said it was bad after he was told by Gandalf. You know, Galadriel, a lady of power, says uh, it's bad. We have, um, so here, this would be kind of, you know, if you're using this in a speech, that would be very short. Gandalf says it's bad. Lauren says it's bad. Galadriel says it's bad. You would want to elaborate a little bit. Gandalf says that all who possess it will be corrupted. Elrond says it's so evil that we can't even keep it safe in Rivendell. Galadriel says that it's so powerful that it would alter her. Do you remember? She says, I would become a queen, terrible, all would love me and despair. That's if I tried to wield the ring, that's what I would become because she was very powerful. We find out she has Nenya. Nenya? One of the one of the three elf rings. Galadriel is its keeper. Um, I just thought of a keep the ring thing that you can add to that if you want to. Galadriel said, you may recall, that if they destroy the ring, everything crafted through the ring will be, will be lessened, including Lothlorien, including all the elven realms. The elven realms operate because they're under the protection of the elves, and the elves are under the protection of the three rings. And the three rings answer to the one ring. The elven realms aren't wicked, you know, but the the beauty that they're preserving will go away when the ring is destroyed. So we can just put that, you know, um, dis destruction of ring, this would go under the keep. Destruction of ring equals um, deterioration of all elvish realms. Do you know what I mean by that? Does that make sense? Elves. So like Rivendell and Lothlorien and all the things that they've made. If they destroy the ring, it's all good. Everything's going to change. Either way, everything's going to change. Sauron's going to destroy everything or things are going to fade. All right, so we have a one. We have a two. We really need a three at, very, at the very least. Um, we have testimony that it's bad. We have... Uh, the fact that it's bad and corrupts all who possess it. Um, what? Who? Who made this ring? Sorry. Oh, what were you thinking, Noah? Sauron. Okay. So I thought maybe we we're going going to go a different direction. Um, Sauron created the ring. 
Is there, does there seem to be anything good in Sauron whatsoever? Yes, he is completely evil. Do you know what? Sometimes I've wondered. Um, I don't. I don't think this is really true, but it has occurred to me. Those of you who know the Harry Potter saga might remember. Okay, I'm so going to ruin the Harry. Po oh, at this point, you, you got to know how it ends. Um, Harry Potter is a Horcrux. Yes. Right. Harry Potter. Part of Voldemort's life. That's okay. If it doesn't mean anything. Part of part of Voldemort's life has been put into Harry. Part of Vol the evil bad guy's life in Harry Potter has been put in into Harry. Um, Voldemort took bits of his life and he saved it in objects so that if he died, part of him could come back. Okay, And so Harry is one of those things. So we find out towards the end of the story and Harry begins to realize, yeah, my death is going to be required <clears throat> to take to take it out. And this reminds me very much of this. When you said Sauron, part of Sauron himself is in the ring. The ring, um, ring, the ring is bound to Sauron's life. Just like Harry is bound to Voldemort's life in the in Sauron. So anyway, my, my wondering was if J.K. Rowling used this idea a little bit. I don't, I'm trying to think of another story where Maybe there was an object or that seemed bound to someone's life force. There've got to be other stories where there's an object that you can't. Oh, I can. Meliager. Um, there's a Greek mythological story about this kid. He was born, and the the mother had. There's a log burning under fire, and the fates came in and said, "Oh, what's the deal with this kid? Do you remember this?" And they said, "Oh, yeah. Well, as soon as that log burns on the fire, his life." line is cut. And the mother heard and she snatched the log out and she put it in a chest. And she said, until Meliager killed like um, her brother and, and had, did some stuff. And then she's so mad, she just got the log out and threw it on the fire. And it killed Meliager where he was because his life was bound to the log. So I guess that is an old idea. They used that same thing in the Heroes of Olympus. It's the Roman series after Percy Jackson. Okay. What about the log? About the log. Yes, there was this character. Main character and his life was bound to a log. See, Mel Yeager. Mel the guy. Okay, so if Sauron created the ring, he's completely evil. His life is bound to the ring. So what, what must we do if we ever want to be free from Sauron? Yeah, so only way to be free from Sauron is destroy ring. All right, I feel like you have been, again, we have three. I wanted to make sure everybody, because there's just a little bit of problems sometimes, like everybody has plenty. Okay, now we're not done because you might say, and I hope you do, but Mrs. Ferguson, if I'm giving a speech, what will my introduction and conclusion look like now? It will be odd if I say, in the book, The Hobbit, you know, nobody starts a speech that way. Um, when everybody gets this copy down, I'm gonna tell you. So you're not done writing. So don't put your stuff away yet. Unfortunately, all my wonderful little tabs are not going to get used today. Tomorrow I'll just have to zip through Holbein's painting faster. That's okay. Maybe, you know what? We got four minutes. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. So some of you can start writing this down. We'll do a little box here. Introduction. Here's what I want in your introduction. You may... Speak in the first person, you know, use the word I, because you're giving a speech at the council, right? You need to say who you are. You need to say why you're there, why you're at the council. And then tell me, uh, tell which uh, you want to do, uh, destroy or keep. Destroy or keep. Does that make sense to everybody? Basically, you're getting up. You know, you would do this. Hello, everyone. I am Dwibbly, Dwibbly the Dwarf. <laughs> we'll just use that one. Uh, I don't care. You can give me as much information about your journey as you want. Like, let, let her rip. 
This is your sort of chance to do a persuasive essay, but just have fun with it, okay? But use the same format. All right, so as much as you want to detail, you can make up a family for yourself. I, you can make up something wicked that the orcs did to your family. I don't care. Go for it. Go for it. And then you're going to have three paragraphs. Does everybody understand what I mean? You're going to have reason one, reason two, reason three. And it's been given to you. I mean, you have it written down on a piece of paper. Basically, you just need to choose a side and form it into paragraphs. Then your conclusion. Um, uh, repeat what you want to do. And so you can see, ladies, gentlemen, dwarves, and elves, that we should destroy this ring utterly and completely. Or, oh, you know what? I thought of another destroy. Uh, oh, I thought of another keep. You can write this down and use it. Um, it seems impossible to destroy it. Because, and I bet you can think of three reasons, because uh, like they're really going to sneak it to Mount Doom and Sauron's not going to catch them. Hello. Because the Black Riders are going everywhere searching for them. They're never going to get away. Because, are you kidding me? You're giving it to a hobbit? What? Are you nuts? Okay, so there's your three. Um, so there's there's others. And then um, destroy, um, you know, you could go, it seems like long odds, but hobbits are little creatures and they can slip in under the radar and you could go with that. But you've, you've got enough without adding that um, material. So um, I don't know. And then just end with a flourish. In other words, uh, just fill this up. And so... We must, we must destroy this ring. It is vital, it is vital to your family and my family, to generations to come. I Just lay it on thick. Lay it on as thick as you want, all right? Um, but you're still going to have five paragraphs. But you're going to be talking, or your character, whether it's a character or made up, whatever. Okay, while people copy this down, we have one minute. Um, let's see if I can, okay, find the best thing. Oh, I loved this. We're going to, I'll just throw this out. This has nothing to do with the plot. It simply has to do with the writing. I never in a million years would have thought of writing a sentence like this or an observation. They are walking through Moria. It says, there was no sound but the sound of their own feet, the dull stump of Gimli's dwarf boots, the heavy tread of Boromir, the light step of Legolas, the soft, scarce heard patter of hobbit feet, and in the rear, the slow, firm footfalls of Aragorn with his long stride. When they halted for a moment, they heard nothing at all, unless it were occasionally a faint trickle and drip of unseen water. Yet Frodo began to hear, or imagine that he heard, something else, like the faint fall of soft, bare feet. To describe the journey by their footsteps. How does Aragorn sound when he walks? How does Gimli sound when he walks? You know, you can't even hear the elves or the hobbits, really, the light step, the soft patter. And then to bring that up, why? because there's another set of footsteps too, that not everybody hears the little, little patter of bare feet walking behind them. Who is it? Gollum, Gollum is on their trail. All right. Uh, with that, I got to let you guys go. Um, have a good week. Read. Uh, yeah. So all you need to do. Oh, guys. Guys, just a second. Listen to me. I already said you don't have to write this paper this week. Basically, you have almost nothing to do because we've done it. But you need to pick a side. You need to choose the, the information and make an outline. I mean, we've almost made the outline for you. And also, think about who you're going to be and maybe add some details. Think of some backstory for your character, OK? I want to see your outlines next week. But you don't have to write this paper, OK? I was talking like we were writing it and I forgot. All right. Awesome.
Okay. Well, I might have you add some things to it. We might add something, but that's okay. Okay. I'll rewrite it then. All right. That that is